This is one of those stories that never started. This is one of those stories that never started. Topa, çok fordda. Bakın, müthiş Stakovya kuzanda var. Golü biraz daha güzelleştirdi belki de bu çabası sadece. İşte Dino Endulovu mükemmel, süper bir gol. Sol ayağıyla. for success made me to realize my dreams are worth fighting for and one day one day I will look back and tell my fear that I'm a man today because I never allowed my fear to overcome my dreams there's one thing that I learned throughout this journey that life is too short to surround yourself with fake friends and superficial people instead surround yourself with family and friends who really care about you and who have your best interests at heart. In my life, I've had thousands of failures, hundreds of wrong decisions, and countless stupid mistakes. But if given the chance to change it, I'd rather not because somehow my past made me what I am right now, who I am right now. Not hard as a diamond, but strong enough to win my fight, my battles. The story of my life and my experiences as a child to where I am today. This is the true reflection of what I went through, which I call my past. The journey of my life and how I overcome many incidents that made me who I am today and what I am today. I believe readers would identify similar experiences and create themselves hope that we can go through many challenges to get by people who sometimes are innocent to their behavior but end up hitting people who never hurt them or cause them pain. We sometimes feel underprivileged because of how people treat us. It also becomes disadvantaged in life that we can even lose hope to believe that death is better than life. My lifelong goal has been achieved. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you are tuned into it. This is Stories from the World Wide Web. And today, guys, we have a very special guest. To begin things, guys, this is a new podcast that is launching. And this podcast, you know, serves to give an impact to future generations. And I'm so excited to be launching this. And, you know, today's guest is so significant in that my dreams were to become a professional footballer. Now, it's so significant that I have a professional footballer on the first episode of this podcast. And it so happens to be a guy who was born where I was born. It so happens that this guy is also, brother man, I stand corrected, but I also believe you are left footed, right? Correct, correct. Correct. I am also left handed. I am left footed. And, you know, it gives me, you know, the great pleasure to actually announce the guest for today, guys, on this podcast. This guy is somebody that I truly respect. And this guy is one of the most decorated, you know, footballers in terms of international representation. And I truly respect him because his story, you know, will inspire you in so many ways. You know, this guy has been in so many countries. You know, he has so much experience in his expertise. And Brother Man, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to this podcast. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. How are you doing, Brother? Uh, I can't complain. Uh, thank you for gracing me with an opportunity to come and, you know, be the first guest on your on your podcast, The World Wide Web. Um, I'm really honored and um, I will definitely try my best to be as honest as possible. 
Awesome, brother. When last were you in Madlera, my brother? When last, when last were you home? The last time when I was home was 29th of December. Oh, yeah? That was the last time I was home. And yeah. I, I, believe, I believe you're in China now. You just came back from Turkey. It's been a couple of weeks since you are back in China. How has it been? How, how is it going that side? Can you hear me? Yes, I just lost you a bit there, brother. Okay, you were saying? Yes, so I was asking, um, you just came back from Turkey and you are now in China um, and I believe you've been there for a couple of weeks. How have things been uh, since you've come back? Uh, look, man, um, I've been here since the 20th of March mm -hmm. and I think China... It, it, uh, I believe it's getting worse and worse by, by, by the time, you know, I was here in 2000 2020, I thought, you know, since, you know, COVID is becoming something from, you know, from the past, yeah. everything would be better. Since well, COVID started in China, mm -hmm. they got everything figured out. The world thought that, you know, China is the world, you know, a real own country to, you know, to attack and get solutions in terms in terms of this pandemic. Yeah. But you know, when I got back, as I said, I, I came back to China on the twentieth of March, and when I got back, uh, I think a month before that, um, there was an outbreak in a few major cities in China, mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, the one which was Shanghai, and you know, it was really really um, frustrating for me because I had to come and be on a twenty one day quarantine, mm -hmm. and you know. Um, there was a lot of things that uh, that disturbed me, you know. Not only me, you know, uh, being in a quarantine, but you know, there were a lot of videos and a lot of information was shared yeah. by a lot of people that were, you know, uh, locked, well, that that were under lockdown in Shanghai. Yeah. So, uh, besides that, politically, besides the political part of China being, you know, in this situation, football-wise, yeah. I believe that China. The, the football and the in terms of the financial part of Chinese football is going down spiral each and every year because yeah. we all know that how what um, impact did the, the, the pandemic cause to the world not only you know in in China but across the globe yeah. you know but I think Chinese companies they haven't really recovered themselves and that is taking its toll on the football or sports in China. Uh, you know, as we know that, you know, most of Chinese football teams that are owned by companies. No, not individuals. Oh. Yeah, not, yeah. not, not, not, not, not, not, not in individuals. Um, so for me, it, it, it's something that I, I wouldn't say I regret, yeah. but, you know, it's something that I, I have to think it more thoroughly um, going onwards, whether I want to stay um in this country for another year or, or so. Mm -hmm. And tracking back to career to your career, brother, I really want um, for the mm -hmm. viewers to understand that for you to get to where you are today, you really had to put in a lot of sacrifice. And I just want to track back to you know when you started in the dusty streets of Tlexdorp, and you know to mm -hmm. when you were spotted by platinum stars. I want you to tell us how was your journey. Um, you know, tell us about your upbringing in terms of how you were exposed to sports. Um, how was your upbringing in terms of the environment that you were growing up in? And until when you were mm. discovered by Platinum Stars, how was your journey to making it pro? Look, um, every time I, I, I, I, I explain or I foretell my story about what really actually happened yeah. from the beginning until now or from the beginning until I turned pro, yeah. you know, I, I get goosebumps, you know, because I remember, you know, I think most of football, most of us, you know, professional football players, we have most similar uh, stories to tell, especially coming from the dusty streets of each and every, you know, uh, villages or re, uh, like urban areas that we come from to turning pro. Our stories are more relatable to each other. You know, so for me, you know, uh, I started 
playing football at an early age, around the age of six, seven, if I'm not mistaken. And going forward, uh, you know, when you're six or seven, you're just playing, you know, one ballet with your friends. And uh, there's no, like, like, there's no rules. You know, you're just playing, having fun. You're not even, you know, betting with money. It's just that uh, the, the rich kid or, you know, the well-off kid who has the ball, if he loses, he takes his ball, you know? <laughs> so I, I grew up, I grew up, you know, loving, loving football because uh, from my mother's side, all my uncles, they played football, you know? They played for one of, uh, I, I believe that you've heard about, there was a team called Blue Bates in in in, in, in Joburton. Oh. Uh, all my uncles played for that team, yeah. you know, and I can take you from my late uncles to the uncle that I have now. All of them, they played football. Yeah. So I think it's something that, you know, it, it, it's, it's in our DNA in my family that, you know, we were, um, you know, we were born with uh, this you know, talent in, in, in, in our blood. So I started playing in the streets. So there was a guy who also, may he soul rest in peace. Uh, this guy, his nickname was Donna uh, because, you know, he was built like Maradona. So we used to call him Donna. So this guy also played professionally for like classic, you know, there was a t- called t- team called Timbisa Classic. Yeah, I remember Timbisa. So that guy, but he never, you know, became famous. You know, yeah, yeah, and he he got he got a big injury, so he came back home to Joburton and he built a team called Dona Young Stars. Okay. So he was going around schools, you know, primary schools around uh, Joburton, recruiting players. So there was only one position, I think, actually two positions that he was lacking. I think it was a striker and a winger, yeah. and the one guy told him that no there's one boy I, I i like to see or i always watch and every time i come back from work i see this boy but i don't know his name you know he's light skinned you know in color he's light skinned i think give this boy a chance yeah. so by that time this guy is telling donna so donna said okay uh when you have time let's go see the boy yeah. so apparently when i was playing in the streets they came to watch me i was not even aware they were watching me and I, they liked what they saw and this guy said, hey, boy, I like how you playing football. I think it's time you come to play 11 v 11 yeah. football and stop this, you know, uh, one pale uh, street football. I said, okay, no problem. But that time I was around the age of nine, you know, turning 10. So when I started playing for, when I started playing for Donna Young Stars, I think I was 10, 10 going to 11. And, you know, my journey continued in, in, in you know, amateur football with Donna Young Stars. Um, I started playing also after Donna Young Stars, I started playing in school. After playing in school, you know, there, there was a lot of, you know, in school, I, I believe that I had more, especially at a younger age, I had more success in school than uh, I had more success in the streets, you know. So I remember uh, when I was, you know, going to a school called Bitumelo, uh, primary school. Um, I started taking my football seriously. I was in grade seven. Uh, I was taking my football seriously. I, we won so many things, you know. We won, so I think, remember, remember we won uh, Bebo, a uh, young tournament. Uh, we were playing also Chappies um, tournament. Okay. So we, we took everything, you know. We took everything. So... But what's funny is that when I was 11, I was playing with kids that were older than me. You know, I was playing for under 14, mm-hmm. you know, when I was 11. So I think in that sense, it, it gave me a good boost in a sense that I, I could, you know, improve my qualities yeah. as a football player, you know? Mm-hmm. So uh, to cut, this, to, to cut the, short, the, the long story short, uh, I remember when I f- finished primary, I went to high school. I played for a team called OI Celtics. So in OI Celtics, we also, bro, I, I believe that in every team that I played for in, in Joburton, I came and I changed everything for the team. You know, we came and we just, you know, dominated. We just dominated from, you know, domestic football league for domestic cups, you know, to, you know, my, you know, my badger, you know, Sunday, 
everything, you know, every game, every team that I played for, I believe, I think it was destined to be like that, you know, not only with my, with my talent, I think also with leadership skills. I think I always had that in me, you know, so we played for, I played for OI Celtics. It was, the team was based in Alabama. Also, we had an incredible, I really had, I really had an incredible time there. We went to, I think we played the original league. We won the original league. We went to the provincial league. We won it. Then we went to the national um, national league, and the national league was held in Port Elizabeth. Okay, there it was a bit difficult. We we didn't do well, but me individually, I did well. So I was chosen for the best. I was in the best eighteen team of the yeah. tournament. Yeah. So I remember one of the. Uh, one of the guys that you know were the part of the panel of scouts for that particular tournament it was Metropolitan uh, Youth Champions mm -hmm. uh, one of the, um, the guys was Paul Anya and he was he used to say to me hey my boy you, you, your, your technique used to it reminds me of my days when I used to play football you know so for me when you get you know accolades or you get uh, compliments from legends uh, people like Paul Ndlanya, you know, uh, the list is endless. I can name a lot of players, legends that gave me compliments. Yeah. It really, you know, gave me that boost that I don't need to give up, you know? Uh, because uh, taking it back to when I was in primary school, I was supposed to have went to play for School of Excellence, you know, uh, Transcendence the School of Excellence, and that didn't happen. And, you know, I was, I, I remember when that move didn't happen when I was supposed to come to move in Joburg and go to play for School of Excellence. Um, when I planned and thinking that the following year I'm going to be in School of Excellence, I want to live in Joburg, and, you know, all, all the dilemma and, you know, the hype that I had that I'm going to be in School of Excellence. And that didn't happen, you know. I, I had a lot of disappointment. I was shattered. I, I felt like, you know, what's the use? I think um, this talent or this sport i'm not gonna you know excel in it i think i need to focus on other stuff yeah. so fast forward going to what i was saying um after oi celtics i was i think i was 15 or 16 i started playing uh for a team called uh, the khakabi young stars you know the khakabi was a, a vodacom team is what it was one of the best teams that we had that time in in joburton they were playing vodacom league that time that time I'm 16, I'm playing with guys who are 25, 26, 27, you know. And I, I, I, I, I felt that everything went so well for me in that team. Um, but, you know, Kasi football, sometimes you, you, you, you, get, you, you, you become talented and famous in this small space that, you know, People from Kosh know you, Tlexdorp, Okni, Stefantin, and Hartebius. Only those people know you. But you, you, you ask yourself, will your career go to the next stage, to the next level? So I had to ask myself a lot of questions that, will my career go to the next level? And that time, you know, you're 16, you're doing grade 10 or grade 11. You know, you, you're stressed that, what are you going to do after football, um, after matric? You know? And I remember when I was in grade 11, one of the school teachers asked me, you know, we, we, we, we had a conversation with one of my school teachers. He said, Dino, after football, what are you going to do? Uh, sorry, after metric, what are you going to do? I said, honestly speaking, sir, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. But I believe if it's not football, which I'm a bit skeptical at the moment because everything is not going as I planned, you know, I think I'm going to be a miner, you know, because my dad was an electrical engineer and was working in the mines. So I said, if this doesn't work, then I have to go work somewhere in the mines. And, you know, funny part, I was not one of the brilliant students, you know, academically. So, uh, also, I was not, you know, dumb, you know. I was not dumb. I was not, you know, an A student. I was just in between, you know. But I knew that I, I, I didn't want to waste my parents, you know, finances to be, you know, putting them under pressure that I want to go to school or I want to go to these colleges in Joburg, paying for an apartment, whereas I'm going to be, you know, 
uh, swallowed by the life of Joburg. So I said, it's either I'm, uh, my life after matric, it's football, or I'm going to work. And that's it. You know, I had that vision and mentality and I had to put that into action. Yeah. So grade 11, finished, grade 11 passed, went to matric. I remember three, um, after my, my prep, I think after my, my prep, uh, we were, you know, we were going close to the um, September holidays. So my mom went to church. I remember my mom went to church and, you know, she woke me up. She said, hey, when I come back to church, please clean the pots and, you know, do the, you know, daily chores that I'm supposed to do as a, you know, as a kid. So I did that. I woke up, I did that. And I remember I took the garbage outside into, I took out the, the garbage outside to the dustbin. So, you know, in Tlekdok, we have, in Joburgton, we have our daily, you know, a newspaper called Lindsay. You know, I think you know about it. Yeah. So I used to make, you know, a plastic, you know, a plastic wow. ball, the, the pampir and stuff, you know. So I saw Lindsay, I said, nah, maybe Lindsay on Friday, maybe my mom, you know, only way bony and something like that. Yeah. So I took Lindsay. When I was about to, I was busy, you know, folding all the, you know, pages of Lindsay and what came to the plastic. And I, some, you know, a big head. knew that in my mind that brother I so i lost a bit sorry, can you hear me? yes i can hear you sorry I just can you hear me? yes so sorry about that so from the time i i started the, the trials until they finish yeah so the the um, the timeline on the trials it took me about three months to complete everything yeah. And eventually, the following year, in 20, 2009, January, on the 10th of January, we were chosen to be part of the 18 squad that going to be training for a week, for five days, in Modernfontein, in, in, in, in Johannesburg, to, you know, because already Platinum Stars, had, they had already a setup. They had few players that they were part of their, on their database yeah. from the previous from the previous players, you know. So they had about eight or nine players who were, you know, who were already in the academy. So they just wanted to, you know, scout players to put them and add them from whatever they had in that particular moment. Yeah. So, Pram Stars was bought by Bafuken, you know, that year, 2009. So, the, the goal and the mission behind Bafuken was to scout players around Northwest. Yeah. So they did that. So they got, they went to Mafiking, it was saying, uh, they went to Rustenburg, they went to Klexdorp, they went to Lachten, no, Lachten makes it to sing. Um, they went to Makwasi, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So you can ask yourself, all those cities that Platinum Stars traveled holding trials, which their first stop was Klexdorp. So from Klexdorp, we went to those cities. So I had to prove myself each in every city until we go to Joburg. Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, so when we go to Joburg, you also still I had another five days to prove myself. Now, when you, you have five days, it's not like those other past three months that you went through. Now you've been, you know, mixed with all those players who belong to Platinum Stars Academy. Yeah. So you had to train with them, you, to, you know, do everything with those players. So it was quite challenging uh, because, first of all, I didn't have where to sleep in Joburg. I didn't have any f a family or an extended family or any relatives in Joburg. So I had to travel back and forth to go to training in the afternoons to train them to use uh, in the afternoons to train them and to come back yeah. to take dog. So it, it was, you know, straining, straining for me. And that time my mother was not working. And, you know, my mom and my dad was no longer together. So my dad was living somewhere else, but around Joburton. So I didn't want to ask 
I was trained my mom to say, hey, please give me 250 rands. You know, I want to use local transport to go to Joburg. Mm -hmm. So I had my other means to, you know, hustle to get this money. But I remember the last day, a day before the last day, actually, I think the last day was on a Saturday, a Friday before the Saturday, I couldn't come back home because I only hustled transport fare to go to Joburg, but I didn't have the money to come back to Joburg. Yeah. Understand? So I had to hustle to get a place to sleep, bro. Mm -hmm. So those one, th that day is one of the scariest. I think it's one of my highlights of my life. It was one of my, the, one of the best or uh, turning points of my career. So I remember I slept in, you know, in a train station. Um, it's, it was one of the scariest things that I've ever, I've ever encountered. But, you know, when, you know, God says do something, you don't need to question, you know. So that, that, that, that you know, thought just, you know, clicked on my mind. Yeah. And I had to, you know, stick to it. And say, Look, it's either I force myself to go back home, but how am I going to come back tomorrow? Because it's the last day and they need to choose the team for tomorrow. That's going to be the part of the setup of Platinum Stars. Yeah. Or I sleep here. So I chose to sleep, you know, in a train station, which nothing happened to me, but I was scared, but nothing happened to me. And the next day I had to walk from the train station to Motor Fontaine, which is about almost 25, 30, 30 kilometers. So I had to walk in the morning to go to, without having nothing, I didn't eat anything, I didn't drink anything. So I had to wake up, I didn't brush my teeth. I didn't take any bath. I had to wake up, walk, so that I can be on time in the morning to make my, uh, to be there. I remember they said we must report for 11, 11 o'clock training. But I got there on time, trained. As I said, you know, God was on my side. You know, everything happens for a reason. And the reason was God told me that, you know, you meant to be here. Yeah. And you know the sky was the sky the sky was not the limit for me, and I, I was chosen to be the part of the setup of Platinum Stars 2009, and from there you know everything just escalated to you know go um, go further for me, and um, you know and everything is history, and that was you know the summary or the background of what actually happened from the dusty streets of Joburgton or Tlexdob yeah. to being chosen you know to represent. At Platinum Stars Academy until uh, in 2009. Wonderful, brother. Your story has so many lessons in it. You know, it has story. Um, it has a story of vision. It has a story of commitment. And you know, those are some of the qualities that you need in this day and age. You know, to have the resilience to never give up, especially when you know that what you have been called to do is something that you have to go out there and make happen. You mentioned the word action. Mm -hmm very important for you to take action but what i want to know is what mm -hmm. are some of the experiences as soon as you made it professionally because i believe uh mm -hmm. your stars was your first professional team and you you mm -hmm. were then spotted by mamelodi sundowns from platinum stars what were some of the mm -hmm. uh, what were some of the challenges that you actually had and what are some of the experiences that shaped you in your first few years of professional football in South Africa? Look, um, I remember that there's a lot of things that, you know, challenges you come across. Um, first of all, when you turn professional, uh, first of all, you, you, you, your bank account was not receiving anything for the past two years when, or three years when your parent opened an, a bank account for you until you started working and signed that dotted, that dotted line to be a professional football player. And that time you, earn, you start earning 30,000 rand. Yeah. You get my point? So you, you start to, you know, you start to attract a lot of things. Friends that, that are not to be your friends. Yeah. For, and, and again, you start to attract women that are not supposed to be the basic woman that was supposed to be in your life, you know? So there are a lot of negative things. That, that's what I, I always say that, you know, money is spiritual, you know? Uh, when I say money is spiritual, it attracts a lot of spiritual stuff. 
it can be a positive spiritual uh, attraction that you're going to attract via mutual uh, uh, um, spirits or anything that you may call it. But that I always say that uh, money is so spiritual. So it, it, it, when you start receiving this kind of money, you attract a lot of spiritual beings or spiritual spirits in your life. It's either those spirits are going to demoralize or distract you from going forward with your career or your life or your, your career is going to be demolished, you know? So for me, I had those moments in my career. I remember from 2009 until 2011, my career started with platinum stars and sundowns, but a lot of people didn't know so much about me, you know, in, you know, in South African football. A lot of, lot of people didn't know anything about me. But in that particular moment, the challenges I faced was alcohol, women, friends, uh, fake friends, uh, injuries. I remember the first time I got injured was 2010. I got injury. Uh, I had a stress fracture, stress fracture on my fifth metatarsal. So you, you, you never got injured. You never uh, went under the knife, meaning that you never went under the surgery and you encounter such, you know, challenges. You are alone. Uh, you cannot tell your family that you got injured. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, played a role or, or challenged me to man up, you know. But at the end of the day, you, you, you tend to ask yourself a lot of questions. And after you encounter those challenges, I think, I believe that, you know, if I gave up, if I really gave up on, on, on, on, on my career, on myself, I think I would, have, I would have not even been sitting in front of you now talking about my, you know, negative challenges. But I remember... My girlfriend that time, which is my wife, and uh, now 2010, uh, she got pregnant. And when she got pregnant, I remember I the season was about to end, and I was on loan from Mamelodi Sundowns to to Bloemfontein Celtic. And okay, I played few games in, in Celtic, but I never scored a goal. And Bloemfontein and Sundowns, you know, decided against of renewing my you know, of or exercising my two-year option contract that I had with them. So now my girlfriend, she's pregnant. Your friends that were there when things were good, now you don't have a job, you don't have an income. Everyone is, you know, they, they, they're staying far away from you because you don't have anything that's beneficial for them. So everyone, they are not there for you anymore. So I had to sit down with myself, with my family, my mom, my girlfriend to say, and my agent also and you know uh credit has to go to my agent who you know in that those difficult times he, he stood by me you know because you know you have agents that also they are there when it's nice and gloomy for any you know professional player when things go bad or sideways for any football player agents you know they tend to terminate their partnership with players but i think i had one of the best agent in that, in, uh, in that, at that time, uh, Walter Mukwena. And he, was, he stood next to me, you know, when I, had a, I didn't have an income. I didn't have an income for like almost four months, you know. But, you know, I, I, I had a, a good supportive uh, structure. My, my girlfriend was there for me. Uh, my mom was there for me. My brother was there for me. And my agent was there for me. And, you know, I had to, you know, be honest with myself. You know, to say, you know, is it the life that I want for my child who's not yet born? Or, or is it the life that I want for my family? So I need to change my ways, you know? Yeah. So I sit down, I had to look at myself in the mirror and, have, you know, have a man-to-man -man chat, you know? Since, well, you know, black kids, we don't have that, you know, we don't have that, you know, moment with our fathers that we can have that, you know, man-to-man -man, uh, conversation with what we need to talk about. So I had to man up and, you know, look at myself in the mirror and have that, you know, psychological, mental conversation with myself to say, you know, it's now or never. And I think I was honest, you know, I broke, I, I broke down in front of the mirror. I broke down, you know. 
I had, I think I had a conversation with myself for like maybe 40 minutes. You know, I broke down because I believe that I had other conversation that I wanted to have with my dad, but I couldn't, you know, because he was not there, you know. And those conversations, I couldn't have them with my mom because she won't relate because, you know, I'm a, a you know, you know what I mean? So yeah, eventually, you know, since something came up for me because I continue to pray and my, you know, my uh, religious side, you know, came back because I, I also, as I told you, I grew up in, from a religious family, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Roman Catholic. So since I turned pro until things went bad for me, I lost my way. I lost my spiritual and my religious being. You know, I, I stopped going to church. I stopped, stopped you know, uh, praying. So that three, four months of, you know, picking myself up, yeah. uh, I had to, you know, get myself back to being religious. So also, as I said, my mom was there for me. I started praying more and, you know, something came up. I had an opportunity and I, was, I got recalled to go on trials in Israel. So from Israel, as I said, from Israel, you know, uh, funny enough, I didn't play, I didn't train uh, for like six months. And boom, I went to Israel. And funny enough, in a space of three or four days training with that team, I played one friendly game. And, you know, they were impressed. And they said, no, we don't want to risk this guy of playing friendly games. We want to sign him directly. And he showed me. And I became so excited that's why i became so hard-headed into into the uh, religious you know um word or the word of god i became so hard-headed in the word of god because of i lived to see one of the miracles happen in my life and to come from where i come from where i was down and out and people that i call my friends and people that i call family you know they just left me you know dry and out and I had to ask myself, is it the life I want for myself and my kid and my girlfriend, uh, which I turned my life around and I went to Israel and everything changed for me. All of a sudden, I got a contract, I have an income. And I just, you know, gave everyone a middle finger to say, look, this is the life I want for myself. Yeah. And since then, you know, I never turned back. I never, you know, turned my head back. Since then, I, I focused and I put my head on the, on the ground until today. What I love about you is that, you know, the comfort zone, you don't like the comfort zone. And that's what we also have in common. I don't like being in the comfort zone. And, you know, you've worked, you mentioned Israel, you've been in so many um, different countries. I believe you've, you've, you've, you've played, you've applied your trade in about four or five uh, countries, if I'm not mistaken. What was the mindset mm -hmm. you, um, what was the mindset when, when you were leaving your your your home country when you were leaving your your family you mentioned that your girlfriend was pregnant i don't know if she was she had given birth at the time but what was the mindset when you were leaving your country and what was the the thinking that you had for your family and everything that um that that you know had to do with your life look when i left i was still a kid man i was 21 years old and that time what i had in mind was to make ends meet, you know? I just want to go go to Israel, get a contract, and work, you know? But you don't know what you, you, you put yourself into, you know? Yeah. Uh, and what you put yourself into, it can be a good thing, can it be a bad thing, you know? So I, I told myself, I will, I will see on the other side, you know? Yeah. Uh, God is taking me through this journey for a reason. And I, I never got this faithful i never became this faithful for me to question his miracle in my life to take me to another country also a spiritual country that you know a uh, lot of us christians believe that you know it's the holy land mm -hmm. you know so i didn't want to question myself but i just told myself i'm going to work and that's it but you find that you face a lot of challenges when you get there uh, that you cannot see your family the way you want and, you know, the culture, how people think, how the Jewish people think, uh, how they see black people, how they treat us. So you had to be strong 
because for me i would i think the first three four months or five months was the most difficult ever mainly because uh it's the first time i've been away from my family uh especially being abroad and you know every man has, has his own needs you know uh it can be sexually it can be spiritually it can be physically you know it can be mentally you know we we know we are human beings we need attachment you know so for me to not have that sense of attachment with my girlfriend with my family you know it it it it it, it made me to be to really know myself you know it really made me to really know what are my strengths especially you being alone you know what do you like what don't you like um your mental capacity what can you your mind enjoy you know because if your mind can withstand you know all the challenges that are thrown to you especially in a foreign country where the language is a barrier and th- there's a lot of um racial abuse that come with being in that particular country but indirectly the racial abuse came in you know yeah. so i had to ask myself if i give up and go back home what am i going to do yeah. and funny enough i i felt welcomed in the sense of my career because in in the in the last 2 3 years since i've turned professional yeah i never got a coach that really you know believed in me you know in sense of giving me an opportunity to play mm-hmm. and when i went go to israel i got it I, i went there and some coach just believed in me each and every game while i was injured bro Uh, tell us about your experience in the under 20 world cup you know you were given you know the blessing and the opportunity to play and represent your country you know at under 20 level so who who are some of the players that you played with and how was that experience for you look for me uh, i think it was one of my biggest highlights because play in less than a year january i was playing for an academy or 2008 I was unknown player who doesn't play professional yeah. and who would say or who who would think that 9 months after that I'll be representing the national team South Africa under 23 World Cup you know how many players I think they were in the that the database of the national team at that time I think we had about 60 70 players that were on the database that was supposed to go to the national team be prior two years prior before I even made professional so for me that I say I told you that everything happened for a reason yeah. god placed everything in a particular time that was ordained you know and it manifested in, in the right time you know so it, it, the experience was was overwhelming because at that time you know I, I was not pro- playing professional i was still you know academy player yeah. then you you know you rub shoulders with the like you know with the likes of players like you know Tulani Serrero, Kemiti Rasmus, wow. Manda Masango, you know the list is endless. Um uh, Ramahlam Pahlele, yeah. uh Tulani Shatswayo, wow. Um uh Kamogelo Mukocho, you know, uh George Maluleka. So the, the the crop of players that we had that time, I think I was out of the whole squad i think i was the only player who was playing academy football oh. but you have to ask yourself what did god yeah. bring me this far which which kind of reason why which reason did god bring me this far yeah. and the challenge that i i faced in the in the world in the world cup is that i didn't play as i anticipated or i wanted yeah. but i believe that it was a learning curve you know i experienced one of the you know there's nothing as bigger than the world cup in any stage of football in any group level you know in a, in any age level from under 17 under 20 under 23 okay not 23 is the olympics and the senior level so the world cup is the highest highest competition you can ever want not to see yourself in you can ask any footballer where you what you want, what you want to achieve i want to see you know qualifying with my national team to the world cup that's all so for me it was a, a blessing in disguise that you know in that particular moment god put me you know in that pedestal in that pedestal to rub shoulders with those kind of players at my age in that particular time whereas i was not even a professional player at that moment so yeah for me you know 
uh, I think I will take that as one of my highlights in my career so far. Interesting. You know, you mentioned that you know God's timing played a huge role in your journey. When opportunity meets God's timing and the preparation that you've been putting in, when all of that happens at the same moment, then your dream comes true. And Dino, you know, you actually played. Um, you know, a very big match in your life as well. Since we are uh, talking about world stage, you know, you played against Chelsea and I, I know that you are also a Chelsea supporter. Um, I also support mm -hmm. you. How was it playing against Chelsea and who was marking you on that day? Look, to be honest, um, I think also I, I can, I, that's one of the things in my bucket list in my career, you know, I... I had a chance to play against one of the biggest stars that anyone can, you know, come across. Yeah. And f the funny thing, is that I think it's one of the best games I've ever played in my career. Yeah. I, I, I when I check the stats, I think I still have the stats on my, on my phone. Yeah. For my team, only my team, I think I was the only one on the green level. Because the green level is you pass... It's like out of 10, you sit seven going upwards. So it's a green level. So if you are 6.9 going downwards, it's yellow. Uh, when you are four point, from five going, you know, 4.9 going downwards, you red, which means you, you perform badly. Mm -hmm. So in my team, all the 11 and the substitute, I was the only player with 7.2 with green. Wow. All the players were yellow and red. So the only thing that I was, I was, I was disappointed. The, more, the biggest disappointment of of that evening was not because I, we lost six zero against Chelsea. You know, yeah. it was the you know the, the the comments that the coach did to me. You know, uh, my coach that time, and it, it hurt me the most that you find all these clubs that play Champions League for the first time from small countries. Mm -hmm. They get there, they they cannot even touch the ball. They, they, they are in the, their players cannot even showcase how good they are in that particular moment. They get beaten 5-0, 7-0, 10-0 in every grade, you know? Yeah. And you check the stats of all those teams that qualified for the Champions League, especially from small countries. You see that the stats are so alarming in a point whereby you would think that it was a mistake for those particular teams to qualify for the Champions League. But for me, I, I, I, I think I had the balls to say, look, it's now or never. I'm going to play. Whether I score or don't score, but I'm going to have the courage, you know, and, and, and, and the charisma to, yeah. you know, showcase that I, I'm not scared. I'm, I'm not starstruck, you know. This stage is where I was meant to be, you know. So I, I did what I had to do and eventually everything went against my team. We lost 6-0. But when you check my stats and you check everything individually, you know, I, I was the better player in my team. But when the, finish, the, the game finished and, and the game ended, you go to the changing room and the coach will tell you that I was selfish. Okay. How is that possible that I was selfish? Yeah. I was playing alone. Yeah. But it's, some, it's one of those things that you try to ask yourself is that, did he want me to be scared to not play my, my football? Mm -hmm. And tomorrow, all these football pundits, when they speak about... Uh, Garabakh from Azerbaijan, their players were so weak, they were so scared to, you know, mm -hmm. to hold the knife uh, and, and, and, and, and, you know, attack or showcase their talent. So for me, I, I, I believe that, you know, it was wrong of the coach to say that, but I didn't want to challenge, you know, his comments or his authority because he's the coach. Yeah. But I, I took it to the chin and accepted it. I said, look, it is what it is. Stats, numbers don't lie. And I still have those numbers on my phone and I, I'm quite happy with it. Wonderful, brother. You've been playing for more than a decade now and you are approaching your mid-30s. Are you thinking about retirement? I did, actually. Um, I think last year I was thinking about retirement. Mm -hmm. um, look, I, you know, your body, you have what you, you, we call the mind. So the mind controls the body. You understand? So I, I believe that the mind still wants to, you know, continue playing yeah. because, you know, normally football players, we, we in our peak or we, they, they call us, you know, a retirement age, age of 35. You know, that's the age I've put myself into that 
probably at the age of 35, I would, I will be back at home. Probably I would be thinking of retiring, retiring, or I would, you know, uh, be playing on one of the teams in South Africa. But for now, it shows that I'm, I'm thinking about retiring because I've planned my things accordingly, you know, uh, outside the pitch. So, um, look, to be honest, I think I've, I've given myself because now, you know, I'm a family man. My kids haven't seen me for the past seven years. I haven't played the role of a husband. I haven't played the role of a, of a father. I've been, I've visited my own home, you know? So basically I, I, I need to be honest with myself that look, I'm left with maximum next year, 2023. If, if I've pushed it, yeah, the end of 2024, I'll be back in South Africa. I'm saying, let's say two and a half years from now, I'll be back in SA. So probably in SA, I'll play a season and I'll, I'm done. I'm yeah. done, you know, because I don't want to be one of those footballers that will be, you know, going to social media or media, trying to badmouth football teams or coaches. That um, this coach doesn't play me, uh, this uh, club club doesn't respect me. No, no, no, no. Yeah. I don't want to be that particular player. I just want to get my my you know my house in order, so that if I come to South Africa, I don't want to come to South Africa and be knocking in in anyone's door for a contract. Who will know and get the news that Dino is free, is coming back home? Who wants me will give me a call. Yeah. Who doesn't give me a call, which means no one wants to sign me. So I'm calling it a day. Yeah. My brother, I know you have yeah. a game tomorrow and I want to wrap up this interview. Mm -hmm. But you just mentioned, um, you know, something about your social media. My brother, I'm inspired by the posts mm. that you put onto social media. Mm. Um, to be honest, I've been following your social media mm. since COVID. When I would see you exercising, there were videos mm. you were posting of you doing hard exercises every day. You know, you were posting Bible verses, you were, mm. you were posting motivational speeches and your profile, your mm. Instagram. And I encourage everybody watching this to actually follow you on Instagram, follow you on social media and just mm. The knowledge that you are actually giving out so what i want to ask is how do you plan mm. your social media because you seem consistent and you post bible verses almost every day so do you plan what you post or do you just wake up read the bible and then or what how do, how do how do you how do you post how do you plan for your social media posts look uh when i started uh three and a half years ago um with this journey of mine you know, religious journey of mine, you know, because I felt that I didn't have time because I told you my family does, we are so religious yeah. and, you know, we are church goers. So I, I, I, I put it upon myself that since I don't have time and I'm always traveling and I don't have time to go to church. Yeah. So the only thing that I can, you know, I can bring myself close to God is either it's church or something else. So since when I couldn't go to church, what can I do? To spread the word of God, or, what, or how can I bring myself close to the word of God? So the only way is either I read the Bible, or I read you know spiritual scriptures or spiritual books, which I do have. So that was my oath to myself that look, I don't have time to go to church, even if I'm in South Africa. Business has you know it take its toll on me, or my family get you know they get the my family get the best out of me, uh, the best of me. So I don't have time to go to church. So the only thing that I have. I always, even you can see even behind me, you know, I have like, you see candles, you see? Yeah. Yeah. So those candles, it means that every midnight here, I pray, you know, every mid, every 12 hours I pray, I lit the candles and I pray. So that's a form of me devoting my life to God. It doesn't necessarily mean I need to go to church to show my devotion to God. But it, it for me, it was the only way when I read, I share the word of God it's the only way that I can show my devotion to God because other people, they show their devotion to God by, you know, uh, you know, the others are pastors, you know, others they are, you know, you, you, you, you, they have different categories. So for me, I think my devotion and my oath to God is to spread the word into social media because social media, I believe it's, it's, it's, it's a, a big tool that a lot of people use it differently. So for me, I use it for a lot of elements. So one of the elements is to share the spiritual uh, journey and uh, the word of God of, in, in my life. So what I do is that I have, you know, you have all those people that, you know, the pastors that, you, that we have in social media. So I, 
I subscribe on their, you know, their uh, YouTube channels. I subscribe in their, you know, daily email, motivational, uh, sharing, you know, news. So every day they would share emails or share whatever they want to share. So when I read and I see something that I relate with and I'm thinking that someone might relate to what I'm reading, then I share it. So sometimes also, you know, in social media, you go to Instagram, you go to Facebook, you go to Twitter. Uh, I have all those, you know, as I told you, spiritual, you know, leaders that, you know, have their own social media. So they share all those, the, that word about God. So I, I read that. After I read that, I, as I said, if I feel that is relatable to what I'm going through and maybe some, probably someone who follows me is, is going through that, I share it. You understand? So that's, that's been what I've, I've been um, doing for the past three and a half years. Interesting, my brother. You know what I'm thinking right now? Is you have a game mm. tomorrow. <laughs> and, you know, mm -hmm. it's actually about to be midnight. And you just mentioned that, you know, at midnight, you know, it's, it's ritual and it's routine that you actually pray. Mm. And I haven't even picked your mind on business mm. because I know you're a businessman, a, a very oh, yeah. prominent businessman. And we haven't even spoken, but spoken about the business side of your life. So um, I'm thinking of a part two. I don't know if you open to a part two where we can talk about the business. Um, I don't know. Once we air this mm -hmm. podcast, uh, once we air this podcast, maybe uh, the people viewing it will actually say, yes, we want a Dino Njovu worldwide web podcast part two. And I think um, mm -hmm. we can do it that way. But just to close it, uh, my brother, maybe I'll just ask you one last question maybe uh, before we can do the whole part two at some point, okay. what advice would you give somebody mm. who, who believes mm -hmm. too late to make it, you know, in terms of whatever they are doing, you know, um, I know I meet, you know, certain individuals who are in their thirties, late thirties, mm -hmm. thirties, and when I approach them, you know, with the intention of changing their lives, you know, and giving them the good word and motivating them to take mm -hmm. care you know, they tell me, Hore, you know what, Wandi, ho, it's too late for na, and I, like, you know, I'm just looking after my kids, and, and that person has a dream, you know, so what advice would you give to that kind of person, mm -hmm. and what advice would you also give to the young children of, like, Clegstop even, who want to, who want to see themselves as a, a Dinon Glove, you know, playing his trade overseas, having played in more than five countries. So what advice would you give to the youth? And what advice would you give to the elderly people who, who, who believe that, you know, it's too late, you know? So maybe we can end it on that question. This is the next big thing. Allah.